last week it was dare to follow, dare to follow, and today it's dare to care or dare to show mercy, dare to show mercy. So when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, where did he get that? Well, it comes from Leviticus 19, verse 18. And it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So Jesus' quote here is telling them in the Old Testament, in the law, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. So to help us live this out today, I'm going to share with you another story. Now, the story that I'm going to share with you, I think is a great story. But whenever they wrote the Bible, they just called it the Good Samaritan. But I'm going to change that today, and I'm going to tell you a story about the Great Samaritan, because this is a dare to be, this isn't a dare to be good challenge, this is the dare to be great challenge. So, and the story of the Great Samaritan is found in Luke chapter 10, verses 30, 37. I'm going to read it to you this morning. You ready? It says, in reply, the the question was asked to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, the question wasn't like, when you and I ask God questions, it's not to try to catch him. It's because we don't know. But if you read this, they were always trying to, the questions they would ask him were always trying to catch him. And they said, oh, so who's my neighbor? And Jesus is like, I'm glad you asked. He says, in reply, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and some translations say a despised Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity or had compassion or had mercy on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day, took him, took out two denarii and gave him, gave the innkeeper, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have had. And so Jesus says, which of these three, the two religious people or the despised Samaritan, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? And the experts of the law said, oh, the one who had mercy on him, because that's not the answer they wanted to give. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, About this story, Princeton Seminary. How many know Princeton Seminary? Right? I know some of you say Princeton Cemetery, and that's okay. But it's Princeton Seminary. They did a study about the, they they called it the Good Samaritan, but we know it as the Great Samaritan. They asked seminary students to prepare a talk on this story, the Good Samaritan. They asked them to get ready to present it, and then they told them that on the day that they were to present it, they would call them and tell them what time they were supposed to be there. Okay, you got it? That's what they did. And then on the day of the presentation, they'd all prepared it. Day of the presentation, one-third of the students, they called one-third of the students, and they told them, you got plenty of time to be here. Take your time whenever you get here to present your story. The second uh, third of them were told, you've got just enough time, okay? You've got just enough time. So if you leave now, you'll be okay. Get here to pre- make your presentation. And then the last group, they told them, hey, listen, basically, you're late, you better hurry. you got to get here now. Okay? So everybody follow along. There's three-thirds there, right? You can all add one-third, one-third, one-third. If you're a math person, what is one-third plus one-third plus one-third equal? A whole, right? So that's all of them. Okay? So here's what happened. So on the way from seminary over to the university, here's the scenario. And I know that's, that's a word we, we argue about. The word is, you know how to pronounce it, right? It's pronounced scenario. Everybody say scenario. It's not scenario. It's with an A. Scenario. So that's, that's why I'm overemphasizing it. The scenario that they set up, every one of them passed by somebody who was slumped over in a doorway and could hardly breathe and obviously was in, in distress and in need of help, immediate help. All of them, every one of them, had to walk past this person in need. So the scenario is set up to see how each of these groups of people would react. So here's the results. You ready? So the first group, which consisted of those who were told, you got plenty of time to get here. Just, you know, so they would come early, right? 63% of them stopped to care for the person in need. That's pretty good. I mean, 63 out of, out of the 100% of those, right? 63 stopped. 
That's not bad. So the second group, the ones that really stopped, the second group consisted of those who were come on time, right? They, you know, you got to get here, okay? 45% of those, that's pretty good. I mean, that's a little less than half, stopped to help. Are you ready for the last one? The last group, the group that were told basically when you get here, you're going to be late, so hurry up and get here. 10% stopped to care for the person in need. Only 10%. And these were all future pastors. Now, before you get mad at the pastors, right? Walk in somebody's shoes for a mile, right? That's what we say. But it's just, it shows this. Think about this. Which one of these groups do you want to be in? Which one of these groups? The 63%, the, the, the 45%, or the 10%? Well, the answer is 10%. We want to be in the group of 10%. Why? Because they stop no matter what. They, they were told, you got to get her. You're already late when you get her. They got this presentation that they had to be told. But, but think about this for a second. Think about this for a second. Um, the, 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 the ones that stopped... No matter how busy they were. So the question is, how, how can we live this out? How can we live this out? Because remember, these, these seminary students were given the project to prepare a talk on the Good Samaritan. And then when given the opportunity to live it out, most of them passed on by. What good is the talk? What good is the story about the Good Samaritan if it doesn't have any practical application for our life or if we don't put it into practice? So how can we live this out? Because the story has no meaning if we can't participate in it, if we can't do something about it. So the first two, we go through the parable of the Great Samaritan, right? And we have the two religious leaders. And what did the religious leaders, both of the religious leaders, walked on by. They were kind of like the people in the Princeton study, uh, Princeton Seminary study. They were a little too busy, a little too much going on. They were, even, they were even doing the Lord's work, right? I mean, priests have the Lord's work. Levites have the Lord's work. They, they were probably on their way to do something for the Lord when they came across this man. But then Jesus said, a despised Samaritan. I love it. Why would Jesus say despise Samaritan? See, because if there's any group of people at this time it, where Jesus was talking about that could get away with, in fact, some Jews, the hatred for the Samaritans was so strong that some Jews would have even said, good, it would be better for that man to die than to have a Samaritan help him. Now, a little background if you don't know. Um, this, this is what Greg was talking about. Pastor Greg was talking about. Ready? After David came his son Solomon, one of his sons Solomon, and it was, your kingdom grew, right? Great time of peace. After a bunch of wars, great time of peace. Solomon solidified the kingdom. And then what happened is after he died, the kingdom was split into two. There were 10 tribes of northern tribes. And you, you read first, second Kings, and you read all those, and you'll, you'll hear about the king of Israel, and then there's the king of Judah. The two southern tribes are Judah. That's where Jerusalem was. And the northern tribes, the 10 tribes, that was in what is known in Jesus' time as Samaria. So why is there a hatred? They're Jews. They're all the children of God. They're all seeds of Abraham, right? What happened? Well, when the northern kingdom, Assyrians, Nineveh, and by the way, if you come Wednesday night, this week, Jonah is going to be swallowed by a whale. I mean, come on. Who does that on Wednesday night? We do. So what happens is when the Assyrians, which was Nineveh, about, eight, about 60 years after Jonah went to Nineveh. The, the Assyrians forgot all about Jonah. They came and attacked. And what happened was the, the, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, the Samaritans in Samaria intermarried. And to the Jew, that was the worst thing you could do. Now, the southern kingdom, well, they, weren't, you know, they weren't jewels of the crown. They were wicked and everything else, but at least they didn't intermarry. So the time of Jesus, the Samaritans, remember in John chapter 4 when Jesus met the woman at the well? And Jesus said, we got to go to Samaria. And the disciples said, Samaria? Woo, isn't there another way around that? No, okay? That's what was happening here. So when Jesus says, so if you don't think Jesus has a sense of humor, Jesus says, he says that two religious people walked by and as far on the other side as they could, and the despised Samaritan was the one who stopped bandits his bleeding. Now remember, remember in the story, the man was laying there half dead because why? He was robbed and left for dead and beaten. So it wasn't like the Samaritan was whistling 
whistle while you're on his way to work. Oh, here's someone needs help. I'll stop it up. It wasn't like that at all. His life, he risked his life too because there was no guarantee that the robbers weren't going to beat him and strip him of everything and leave him to die. So he risked everything. He was a despised Samaritans. And I love it that Jesus says it. And it says that when the Samaritans saw him, he took pity on him. He had compassion on him. He, he had, and then not only that, but I think Jesus kind of threw salt on the wound and said, the next day at the end, he says, if I owe anything else, I'll pay for it. Right? Because the Jews were always, the religious people were always talking about, you know, we went to the, the extra mile, right? And Jesus says, oh, if they ask for a coat, give me your outer garment too. You know, he was always telling them that, yeah, it's, it's not about that, right? So he says, put on my tab, basically. So how then, based from this story, how then do we show mercy? The, Dubai, the despised Samaritan showed mercy, had compassion, had pity on this man. So how then could we remember this, that mercy is love in action. You know when you're sitting there watching TV and the commercial comes on and the lady sings a song, in the arms of an age, and all these puppies come on and they're just so sad. And you're like, oh, that, I feel so bad for them. And then the commercial's over and then you just move on, right? That's called sympathy. That's not compassion. See, compassion is when you have that mercy, when you see those puppies, and then you go buy all those. No, don't, don't, don't. Because that's what Tiffany will do. She'll go buy all the puppies. We don't need any more puppies. And so compassion is when you are moved to action. Mercy is what moves us to action. It's when God saw the sin in the world and was moved with compassion and sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. It's mercy is love and action. Remember that. So how can we then show mercy? How can we show compassion on a world? How can we love our neighbors? Well, there's a few things. Ready? First one's this. We can give encouragement when someone is hurting. Encouragement when someone is hurting. To encourage is to give courage to someone. Isaiah 35, 3 and 4 says this. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands, encourage those who have weak knees, and say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. So there's three kinds of people here that's mentioned in Isaiah that we can show encouragement to. Three kinds of people need encouragement. First is those who have tired hands. Those are, are people who are dealing with physical pain or physical exhaustion. We have people in our church that are constantly dealing with physical pain. And if you know anything about physical pain, it can wear you down. It can wear you down mentally. It can wear you down emotionally. And so what can we do with people who have tired hands? We can encourage them. We can literally come alongside them and give them a hand and help them whatever ways we can. We, we can help them walk into the church. We can help them park their car. We can sit with them. We can do things to encourage them and help them. Second thing is this, people with weak knees, those would be people who are emotionally weak. You know anybody like that? People that are overwhelmed with life? Maybe that's you. Overwhelmed with life. Life's pressing you down. It's like you're in that that garlic press, and it doesn't feel good. So what can we do? People are overwhelmed. They're emotionally weak. We can encourage them by saying, hey, come on, keep going. You can make this. You can do this. Walk alongside them for a little while. Encourage them to keep going. And there's the third one is fearful hearts. This would be people who are spiritually struggling. Listen, I wish that it was like this. Jesus says, follow me, and we follow him. And our life goes like this. And then we go to heaven. Wouldn't it be great? See, if we could all vote, wouldn't we vote for that? But most of our lives go like this. We, our life before was like, ah, and then we come to Jesus like this, right? And sometimes it's a little down, and then sometimes, because life happens. The key is that once this moment takes place, as God is with us. God will never leave us or forsake us. So we up and down, but that's how life is. And life is, and then finally we get to heaven, and we made it. Right? Now, I don't know about you, my life's like this. You with me? Anybody who's got their life like that? It's like, I, I wish my life were like this. <laughs> it doesn't do that. That's spiritually. And we can come alongside people and we can say to them, you're going to make it. Hey, I've been there. I've been where you are. 
or I've not been where you are, but I know I'm going to be at some point because life happens to everybody, right? And so we want to remind them and encourage them that God is with them. You know, sometimes you just need a reminder. You know, sometimes when life's weighing us down and, and we're, we're feeling it, we're feeling it, sometimes it's good somebody just remind us, say, man, hey, listen, God's with you. I mean, we know that, don't we? But isn't it good when somebody else reminds us, especially we, somebody that we know has been through it too? So when someone's been through a lot, says to me, hey, God's with you. You got this because he's on your side. So encouragement, listen, encouragement is one of the main reasons that New Life Lakeland exists. So we're to encourage each other. We can show mercy on our neighbors. We can show compassion, love, and action on our neighbors when we encourage them. Hebrews 3.13 says we are to encourage one another daily. How often? Daily. Daily. So if you haven't been encouraging people daily, let's get busy. So first, we encourage others when, we encourage when people are hurting. Second, direction when someone is lost. Now, I'm not talking here now. I, moved, I lived in Kentucky 19 and a half years, right? I lived in Louisville, and here's Louisville, and then the rest of Kentucky. Like, when you think of Kentucky, you think of anything but Louisville, because Louisville is just a big city like anything else. It's like, it's like Louisville is not even in Kentucky. It's a blip, right? So I'm talking about when, when it, direction when someone's lost, Okay. It's not like the old man at the store, you stop at this little town, the gas station, you say, hey, I need to get to so-and-so. And they go, well, you go down this old tree, it looks like this, and when you get there, you turn left, and then you go down, all, you know, down there a couple ways, you see the fence post, when you get the old fence post, there'll be a dirt road to the right, don't turn the dirt road, you go to the next dirt road and turn right. <laughs> and the guy, he's not been there 40 years, but that's how he remembers it. And so you're driving down there, not as there not a tree looks like this, there's not even a tree. There's apartments and buildings. You're like, ah, not that kind of direction, right? Talking about direction, we're talking about what the Bible talks about giving direction. When it talks about giving direction to those who are lost or even those who are, are uh, um, as believers, are struggling in their faith, it's literally talking about correction. Giving direction is giving correction. It's helping people find their way to God or back to God's will getting back in line with what God had them to do. In Luke 73, we were told, Jesus says to watch yourselves, be alert. See, if you see a friend going wrong, correct them. That sounds easy, right? It sounds easy, right? But it's not. It's tough. And we have to be intentional about it. Now, I want to qualify this for a moment. When we talk about when you see a friend who's struggling and when we see a friend who's not going the right path and correcting them, want to be careful here. I'm not talking about whether or not they're wearing the right clothes. Because we all have opinions about how we should dress, right? We all have opinions how our hair should be, right? We all have opinions about these things. I'm not talking about those. Those are your opinions. I'm talking about God's word. When you see a brother or sister in Christ that's struggling in their walk with God, then you go to them and you correct them. And I'm going to clarify that even further when I talk about correcting them, okay? And it's different talking to a believer who's struggling in their faith and talking to someone's lost, Right? It's, it's, it's different things. We, we have friends, and we have some good friends, and we watch them making bad decisions. You ever watch your friend make a bad decision, right? And you're just like, you know, you want to say, I told you not to do that, right? I told you not to do that. But that's not what we do. What we've got to do, it always begins in prayer, right? It always begins in prayer. And, it, and it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Right? It's uncomfortable. It's like if you, if you ask pastors what's the least favorite thing about their job, number one. Number two is taking offerings. Number one is when you have to correct someone. It's, it's the least comfortable thing we ever do. But if we care enough about our friends, then I think we'll get, be more into it. Listen, we don't, when it comes to correcting people, this is why I say we be careful and prayerful about it. We don't do this to embarrass them. We don't do this. They're struggling in their walk with God. We're not trying to embarrass them. We don't do this to be judgmental. We don't do this to call them out or make them look bad. We do it to help them avoid the poor consequences that their actions might bring. That's love. That's compassion. That's mercy. Now, picture 
a beach scene. Y'all love going to the beach, right? Go to the beach and just sit and get burnt. Come back to church red on Sunday, right? That's what we do. So here's the beach scene, that nice beach scene. I think that's up there in the corner. No, that's not me. Okay, so the real muscle-bound guy up there. Yeah, definitely not me. Okay, so we're at the beach, and maybe you're there with a spouse or with a friend or one of your children or grandchildren, you're at the beach, and you're just having a great day, and you're walking along the water's edge, and maybe your spouse or your friend or child or grandchild, they go out in the water a little way, and then all of a sudden, what happens? da na da na da na That's kind of scary. I was kind of hoping for a dorsal fin, but this is what we get. So all of a sudden, you're there, and you see the fin out of the water, don't you? Ho hopefully you don't see that. If you do, they said to poke him in the eye. And I'm like, I'm too busy swimming that way to poke, stop and poke him in the eye. I'm not going to stop and give him an opportunity to eat me and poke him in the eye. I don't know. Punch him in the nose or something. You see the fin. What do you do? You don't go... You do that. You, you, what you do is you don't, you don't go, you don't go. I know well, I made this Faust joke this morning. I want to be careful. Uh, you, you don't go, I better go back and get a drink before I, is that's, yeah. You, you love that person in the water, right? You start screaming and yelling. You might even take a few steps. If it's a, if it's a grandchild, I'm punching the shark in the eye. Are you with me? You might even swim out a little bit. You're going to do everything you can to warn them because this is coming. Right? And so that's how we should be. We will do everything we can to avoid the physical pain of the chomp, chomp, chomp. And no, that's not the Florida Gator chomp. We all do something to help them, wouldn't we? 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. As believers, we are to always be prepared. When we see someone that's lost, we should always be prepared. It doesn't mean be perfect. In fact, sometimes in our imperfection, that shows more about, more about God than us trying to be perfect. We should always be prepared to give a reason. So first, we encourage encouragement when someone's hurting. Second is give direction when someone's lost. The next step to showing mercy is giving of ourselves when someone needs help. The story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus tells us that a priest and a temple assistant, two very religious people, the very people that you would expect to stop and help, ignored their fellow Jew. Can I tell you something as an aside? Even though the world, the people in the world, sometimes despise Christians and make fun of us, and Hollywood makes fun of us, that we're a bunch of crazy religious nuts, which, by the way, we are, do you know that the world still has an expectation of us of being good people, of helping others in need? They, they kind of, and when we don't do that, it doesn't look poorly on us, it looks poorly on him. So the world, even the world's hatred of us, they still have a high expectation of us for being good people. So let's, let's be, let's not just be good people, let's be great people. Let's give one of those. See, there, there, there's, to those religious leaders and the kids in the Princeton study, the people in the Princeton study, there was more important things for them to do. And it's easy for us to get caught up in the busy lifestyle. Listen, I, it's, it's easy for, as a pastor, to say, I'm doing God's work. I can't do that. I'm doing God's work. And I'm right. But don't you know that even if you're doing God's work, that if God puts someone in your way that he wants you to help, that he knows you're doing his work, but this is a pause that he has for you, a pause for you to stop and do and meet the need of that person, no matter how busy your life is, no matter what you're working for, no matter if you're working for God or not. In fact, Proverbs 14.21 from the Message Bible says this, it's criminal, it's criminal to ignore a neighbor in need. It's criminal to ignore a neighbor in need. So failing to help someone in need is criminal. So one thing we know about people who commit a crime is it leads to some sort of consequence, right? A criminal leads to some it, it denies us money, time, freedom. It denies us our reputation. It denies us even our future if we commit crimes. So in the same way, when we ignore a neighbor in need, there are consequences for us. 
See, when we see a neighbor in need they're, they're, and, and we don't help out, and I'm not saying we can't help every person out. We can't, be, it's impossible physically, materially, spiritually, it's impossible. We would exhaust ourselves and die, okay? But when God places them and we know that God's speaking to us to help someone in need, if we don't do that, it affects us. It affects us. There's consequences. First consequence is that person doesn't get what they need and God sent you to meet their need. But there's also another consequence for us is that we're not listening to God. And we are one day going to answer to God for not obeying what he says to do. And that kind of seems harsh. Well, it is because God's serious about his people. And God loves everybody just as much as he loves you. Proverbs 11.25 says this, and this is the best part. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help helps others are helped. See, the world's economy says give so that you can get, right? Give so you can get, not in God's economy. God says when, when I ask you to do something and you give, when you take care of others, I'm going to take care of you. I don't know about you, but I would rather God take care of me. You know, we talk about tithing, right? And we say we, the tithing, according to the Old Testament, is giving 10%, the first fruits of our income. We give to the church, which is God's God's. Uh, uh, on earth, right? God, where God resides on earth. And we say to th that, that is those of us who have been tithing forever, and we know that God will do more with the 90% that he allows us to have than the 100% we could have. Because God's economy is not the same as the world's economy. So I want to encourage you today. Bible even says, God even says, test me and see if I won't do that for you. Okay? So I want to encourage you. I, I'm just throwing that in there, given. Giving. God's economy is not like the world's economy. So give, and God's going to give back to you. It may not be in the form of money, but maybe in the form of a, a wonderful wife after you've lost, right? Maybe in the form of, of your children growing up and knowing Jesus, but God is always going to bless us because that's who God is. When God takes care, when you take care of others, God takes care of you. Amen? It's good preaching, amen? It's okay if we talk about tithing a little bit this morning. First, encouragement when someone's hurting. Second, give direction when someone's lost. Third, giving when someone needs help. And here's the, the last one, and this is a tough one. It's forgiving when someone lets you down. Forgiving when someone lets you down. People are going to let you down, okay? I'm going to try not to, but I guarantee at some point I'm going to fail you. Why? Because I'm human. I... Good news for you is I'm not Jesus. Right? Good news for me too. Right? This is the most difficult of these four steps of showing mercy, of being a good neighbor, of loving your neighbor. Forgiving someone they mess up when they hurt you or when they let you down. So it happens all the time, doesn't it? And sometimes it's the same people letting us down all the time, over and over. Because we have family members, don't we? People let you down. And it's frustrating, isn't it? But here's the thing. The first thing is, people are going to let us down. And it's frustrating to us. It's unavoidable. It's undeniable. It affects us. But here's the second thing that's just as frustrating. You ready for this one? We're going to let people down. We're going to let people down. Have you ever let someone down? Yes, yeah. And if you haven't, you're going to join the club at some point because you're human. So just as frustrating as it is when someone hurts us, we have to understand we are going to hurt someone else, not intentionally. That's why it's so important that we are quick to forgive. See, when I mess up, I want you to forgive me quickly, which is why I am going to forgive you quickly. That's how it should be. That's how we love our neighbors. When we know that God has an amazing love, unconditional love for us, that's the expectation that he has that we should have for our neighbor. We should love them. And we do that through forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So, what do we have to do to earn God's forgiveness? Nothing. 
Nothing. You've accepted. So if God gives his forgiveness to us freely, shouldn't we give our forgiveness to others freely? That's the challenge today. Now, I, I, want, I want to say this to you. Because forgiveness is a, it's a wild animal, isn't it? It's tough. And you'll hear, forgive and forget. Forgive and, you know, I want, I want to say that. Let me qualify this this morning. You ready? I'm not saying that you have to reconcile your relationship with that person that's hurt you. Because there may have been abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse. I'm not saying that you have to reconcile with that person. I'm not saying you ever have to have a relationship with that person. And if you're not sure whether what I'm talking about is biblical, see me after church and we'll talk about it. But we do have to forgive. We do have to forgive. You don't ever have to talk to them again. Leave that part to God. If, if God chooses to restore the relationship, that's, that's God. But you do what God tells you, and that's forgive them because you want others to forgive you. God gives freely to us. We should give freely to others. Don't wait any longer. See, when you hold on to unforgiveness, you become more and more bitter and resentment. You begin to resent, and it comes out in how you treat other people. Don't let that root of bitterness grow in your life. It's not going to hurt them one idea, one bit. What I learned about forgiveness is I was with my dad, who's to heaven now. By me holding on to that, guess who didn't care? He didn't care. It was eating me up. Wasn't eating him up, eating me up. And when I chose to forgive, guess what happened? I said, God, I believe in this relationship in your hand. And it was seven years until we talked again. Yeah. And that's okay. When you hold on to forget unforgiveness, you become bitter and resentful. Let it go. Let it go. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. It's hard. It's hard to let go and forgive someone that's hurt you. Especially there's a lot of ways people hurt you that it's hard to forgive them. But... There's no qualifications. Jesus says, forgive them. That's how we're going to be loving our neighbor, forgiving them. John 13, 34 says this, and when you stand this morning, we're going, to, we're going to end the service. Make sure you stop back by the table this morning. And if you're with us for the uh, first time, or maybe you've been here a couple of times and you haven't stopped by, out to, to the right, there'll be a pastor there. I'll try to get out there too. But we have a gift for you. We love you, and we're glad you're here. Uh, this evening, Maria will be preaching. And I uh, want you to come from uh, Pastor Murray preaching. Wednesday night, small groups and the big fish eating Jonah will be happening Wednesday in here. John 13, 34, Jesus says this. this is how we're going to end it. Ready? He says, a new command I give you, love one another. No conditions. And then he says, as I have loved you, unconditionally Went to a cross, died for your sins, rose from the dead unconditionally. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus said if you want to be great, you have to love your neighbor. So here's the challenge to love your neighbor. Give encouragement when they're hurting. Give direction when they're lost. Give yourself when they need help and forgive when they let you down. This is how we love our neighbor. Let's pray.